To celebrate the upcoming 10 year anniversary of Peaky Blinders, I thought I would rank every single character pertaining to perhaps one of the greatest TV series ever made, and a personal favourite of mine being Peaky Blinders. Now just to clear some vital info up, I will only be ranking the main characters whom are vitally important to the show, I will not be ranking little side characters whom appear briefly here and there. Also, a quick disclaimer, these are solely my opinions and you may very well disagree. Leave a comment in the description if you do, and let me know what your rankings would be. Now to get started, coming in at 35 is Darby Zabini. Zabini at first seemed like he could be a fantastic, intimidating villain in Season 2. In Season 1, he was name dropped as being one of the big London players, and in Season 2, Episode 1, everyone in the club seemed to work for or be in relation to Zabini. It should be noted as well that this was of course his club, but his power and influence could be sensed in the air. Furthermore, Zabini had some great moments like the initial torture and beating of Tommy, and the plan he concocted to get Alfie to betray Tommy, which, funnily enough, was entirely undone in the final episode. Unfortunately, however, his character didn't really eventuate into anything substantial, nor were there any real threat to Tommy or the Peaky Blinders. It is even embarrassingly stated in Season 4 that Sabini's gang was taken over very easily by Luca Trangretta's mafia. Along the same line of embarrassment, Tommy also tells his new Italian chef that after he's dealt with Luca, he will be coming for Sabini, showing that Sabini's gang really has no power anymore and is dwarfed completely by the Peaky Blinders and their power. However, despite all his shortcomings, as a character, he was always entertaining on screen, having some incredibly funny moments, intended or not, and always bringing life to the screen with his extreme paranoia, rage, and heavily emotional reactions to the people around him and situations which he found himself in. Coming in at the first bonus spot of three is Inspector Moss. Now, not much can really be said about Inspector Moss. He is present in every season besides season six, to which he is still name dropped. But nonetheless, his character, whom initially started off as a good straight cop, quickly became corrupted by the Peaky Blinders, and now he happily works with them. He is always interesting to see on screen, and I just felt like including him, so yeah. He is uh, my bonus spot number one. Coming in at number 34 is Reuben Oliver. Now I'm guessing a lot of you completely forgot this character even existed, but his role can't really be forgotten. For reference, Reuben Oliver was in Season 3 of Peaky Blinders, and acted as Polly's first real love interest. And now, although he wasn't in any other season, his role in Season 3 was felt hard, and really aided in Polly's character development. He helped her incredibly get over her horrific rape in the season before, and also Reuben was the first person Polly seemed to be genuinely happy, or in love with. And for that alone, he comes in ranked at 34. At 33, Billy Kimber. At first, Kimber came off as a seemingly powerful individual with great reaches, men, and capabilities. However, upon their first meeting, it was quickly shown that he was not the brains behind his operation, and did not seem all that intelligent, being far too emotionally reactive and controlled. It seemed as if his accountant actually handled the logistics and inner workings of the organization. However, it should be noted that he was willing to, and damn right nearly did, kill Tommy Shelby and the Peaky Blinders gang, shooting Tommy in the chest and killing Danny Wizbang. His only downfall was his supreme arrogance, to which it got him killed as his bullet did not kill Tommy. Although he was the TV series' first ever villain, he was decent and always entertaining on screen to watch. 32. Finn Shelby Finn is there from the start, appearing as a little boy in season 1, and his biggest moment in this season is nearly blowing up Tommy's car with a rigged grenade. So, from the beginning, we knew what type of role Finn would play. From there, he ages up rather fast into season two, and then more consistently throughout the rest of the seasons, growing as a character. In season one to three, he really is just there as a background character, the youngest brother, the one who didn't go to war, and doesn't share the same bond as Tommy, Arthur, and John. However, in Season 4, after John's death, you can see both Arthur and Tommy are trying to age and mature Finn, making him suitable for the life they lead. This can be seen from such as Tommy talking to him about his experiences with the women, 
and then advising him to take revenge on one of the Italian gangsters after Arthur is presumed dead. Finn understands these lessons and adapts this further into season 5 and season 6, in which during season 5, Finn is a bit of a wild gun, being very arrogant, oblivious and hot-headed, running irrationally and interrupting the meeting with Chang, Tommy and Arthur, and then foolishly telling Billy that they were shooting a fascist on the night of Mosley's speech. Even after Arthur has told him not to risk Billy's life with secrets he not, need not know. Further into season 6, Finn gets married to a woman called Mary and is finally kicked out of the family after siding his loyalties with Billy over his own blood being Duke, Tommy's new son. So overall his character is decent but is entirely incomprehensible and oblivious to the dedication and duties he was required to carry out as a member of the Shelby family and the broader Peaky Blinders. There is a chance he will return in the movie, but it is unlikely seeing that the actor who plays Finn has stated he wants to break away from Peaky Blinders. 31. Laura McKee Her gang and more responsibly the IRA were responsible for killing Polly, Aberama and Barney and thwarting Tommy's plan at the end of season 5, uh, which is why he failed to assassinate Mosley. Yes, she tries to kill Arthur in the final episode of season 6, but besides that, she's seen to be really working with Tommy the whole season. And she really only gets ranked above Billy Kimber and Sabini because she manages to kill Polly, Abarama and Barney, which are all vital characters. And I truthfully believe that Polly wasn't even meant to be killed as unfortunately the actor Helen McCrory, who played her in real life, passed away. So originally I believe the IRA was just meant to have killed Abarama and Barney. So besides that, uh, she's also killed quite easily in season six. She's outmaneuvered and outsmarted by Arthur and the Peaky Blinder gang with help from Tommy, obviously. At 30 is Bonnie Gold. Now, what can I say about Bonnie? Abaramba's son and a true boxer boy. He was always a pleasure to watch on screen and his cockiness with regards to boxing was entertaining and really sold his character well. He overall, however, didn't really have much development throughout the series and died in a rather quick fashion, being shot in the head by Jimmy McCavin and then crucified. So, yeah. It would have been great to see more of Bonnie, and that's why he comes in at rank 30. Bonus spot number two, Jeremiah Jesus. Quickly in between Bonnie Gold and the next spot is Jeremiah Jesus. Overall, he didn't really contribute much, but he had a killer scene in the final episode of season 6 when he reigns from heaven above with his machine gun. As well as this, he was one of the original war boys alongside Tommy and Arthur. Furthermore, he has been there since the start and is one of the gang's most trusted and loyal allies. Coming in at number 28, Gina Gray. What can I say about Gina Gray? She was a slight antagonist in season 5 and then a full-on villain in season 6 not hesitating to kill the Shelby's kids in the final episode. She was Michael's wife and niece to Uncle Jack. Her character, albeit really doesn't or didn't do all that much in Peaky Blinders, she had a few good scenes with Tommy, specifically in season six, where he catches her sleeping with Mosley, and in episode one, where he confronts her over arresting Michael. Her character ultimately fell a bit flat. Now for the final bonus spot being number three, we have Francis, Tommy's chief maid. Now what can I say, Francis is nearly as reliable as Johnny Dogs. Nearly. She is always shown to be on Tommy's side, offering to help whenever she can, even finally earning her right to sit at the table with the family in season 6 final episode, during their final meal. She is a wonderful, kind-hearted character, whom genuinely has the best interests at heart for Tommy and his family. Coming in at 28 is Jesse Eden. Now, Jesse Eden played quite a minor role in the whole series, being really another love interest for Tommy and perhaps his first actual legitimate business opposition, with reference to the forming of strikes to put him out of business. But besides a few decent scenes with Tommy, such as their first meeting and their other scenes in season 4 like the dinner, and the meeting in her apartment where Tommy explains that he's a constable for the police, um, she is never really seen again. In season 5 she makes two brief appearances and then in season 6 she is nowhere to be found, which I admit was a little disappointing. However, nonetheless, 
the scenes she did have were enjoyable, and that is why she is ranked at 28. Coming in at 27 is a complete newcomer really, Hayden Stagg. Hayden Stagg was only in season 6 of Peaky Blinders, but his impact was felt throughout the whole series. He acted as the manager of the Liverpool docks and shared a great scene with Arthur in season 6 where he talks him through his addiction and helps him to get over his addiction. It is really a wonderful scene, acted beautifully and scored beautifully. He as well shares another great scene with Tommy in season 6 where they both challenge each other's ideologies once again and have a deep conversation. I would have loved to see more of his character. He is hoping he will once again be in the movie. As last time we left off with him, he had acquired a lucrative weapon importing deal with the Peaky Blinders. 26 is Esme Shelby. Now, Esme really didn't have a whole lot to do throughout Peaky Blinders, and for the most part she was seen as a confidant for John, being also his wife. She does have some noticeable scenes such as inciting Tommy to run away with her and start a new life as well as in general confronting John about Tommy and his decisions. In season 4 this is specifically so, as after John is nearly hung, she is very rude to Ada and dismisses any idea of communicating or seeing Tommy, with her even insulting the Shelby company when Ada arrives at their house. Furthermore, after John's death, she vows to leave the family and doesn't reappear until season 6, in which it's probably her most prominent role in the series. Tommy approaches her family's camp, to which she now seems to be the leader, and then goes on a treasure-like hunt with Tommy to find the source of his daughter's illness. Once finding the source, she gets payment from Tommy, and then in the following episode reveals that he has a son, and that is the last time we see her. She showed character development through the initial transitioning from quiet wife to a wife who questions the morality and actions of both her husband and their gang, finally resulting in her departure and becoming her own leader, away from the Peaky Blinders. At 25, Jack Nelson. I actually really like Jack Nelson's character. He is purely ranked this low because he had such a small amount of screen time in season 6 of Peaky Blinders. However, on the contrary, if this was a ranking of the most powerful Peaky Blinders villains, he could most possibly be the most powerful villain Tommy has ever come into contact with. Nelson is depicted to be an American gangster, whom has vast networks of power, even including the President of the United States. He is the uncle of Gina Gray, Michael's wife, and more important, has many similarities to Tommy, such as the fact that both men started from obscurity and eventually rose to very high social standings and obtained satiable power. On top of his power and pure intelligence, which was conveyed with his manipulative conversations with Tommy and Mosley, he's also not afraid to get his hands dirty. This can be seen when he intimately tortures Billy in the shower rooms in season 6 of episode 5 and forces him to do his bidding, to betray the Peaky Blinders. Overall, the screen time which Jack Nelson had in season 6 was great. I enjoyed every scene he was in, and he portrayed a powerful American gangster well. Coming in at 24 is the forgotten Shelby, Tommy's long lost son, Duke. Now, Duke, like Hayden, was only in season 6, but wow, his impact was felt. Duke was literally in two episodes, and somehow, he was already better, as well as more liked than Finn. Duke had this charisma to him which was amazing and every scene he is in was amazing. From the first confrontational scene with Arthur in the garrison to one of his final scenes in which he basically tells Finn to fuck off, it's great and I really wish to see more of him in the movie. 23 is Jimmy McCavin. Now, McCavin is simply above Nelson because he actually manages to kill a member of the Peaky Blinders, as well as leaving live landmines literally on Tommy's front lawn. The first time we see, or more accurately hear, Jimmy McCavin, he is singing a sinister theme song like he's making a goddamn WWE entrance. <laughs> then he goes on to shoot Abarama, break his son Bonnie's jaw, crucify him, and then shoot him in the head. It makes for some great TV. However, beyond these acts, he isn't really expanded upon, and he doesn't seem overly intelligent like the villains are ranked above him. He is more like Arthur than Tommy, and unfortunately, seeing that he was not in season 6 at all, his character had a very unfulfilling ending. Although in history, by the time season 6 takes place, the Billy Boys are technically disbanded and over. Overall, he was a decent villain whose main motive was controlling and gang expansion. Possibly if the character had more screen time and had a greater impact on the story, he could have managed to be ranked higher. Coming in at 22 is Colonel Ben Younger. 
Now, Ben Younger played a minor yet major role in the show, being a colonel and secretly in relationship with Tommy to help him bring down communists and the fascists, etc. As well as this, he was Ada's daughter's father and shared a special relationship with Ada. He was honestly one of the only true good people in Peaky Blinders, genuinely trying to contribute to a good cause and change the world for better. He is seen as a good soul as far back as his initial appearance in season 4, when Ada is forced to undress and the men watch. Younger then genuinely apologises after he learns of this and feels genuinely bad. Tommy as well states on multiple occasions that he is a good bloke. He died in a very unfortunate way being a car bomb, and I wish we had got to see more of his character, but nonetheless, he was always interesting to watch and contributed to the show very well. Coming in at 21 is Tatiana Petrovna. Uh, now, Tatiana was one of the main characters in season 3, and boy was she entertaining to watch. Be it from playing Russian roulette in Tommy's house, or simply just being a smart ass for Tommy. Her scenes were always interesting, entertaining, and enjoyable. She played a key role in basically helping Tommy get over Grace, and also played a key role in helping the Peaky Blinders advance their business and ultimately survive. It would have been great to see her in one of the later seasons as a nice little callback, as she said she was moving to Venice at the end of season 3. However, she did not appear. But there is always a chance for the movie though. At 20 is Curly. What can I say? Curly is literally the best. Always reliable, funny, and down to earth. You really couldn't ask for a kinder man. As well as this, it's worth noting the exceptional amount of weight his actor Ian Peck lost between season 5 and 6. Congratulations mate and well done on playing a great character. Coming in at 19 is Isaiah Jesus. Now Isaiah is one of those characters whom has been around since day one. Son of Jeremiah Jesus and a true Peaky Blinder. In the earlier seasons he didn't really get up to much. He had an amazing scene in season 2 however where a man in a bar is racist to him so him and Michael bash him and get into a pub brawl. Furthermore, in season 5 and 6, he has got some great moments. Season 6 in particular comes to mind. Uh, for me, this is where Isaiah shined the most, going from a relatively small character to someone who, who was prominent in season 6, having great dialogue exchanges with Ada and Arthur, as well as a killer warehouse interrogation scene at London Docks. His character growth was exceptional, and I can easily say him becoming one of the main characters in the movie. It is deserved and his character is just great. Freddy Thorne comes in at number 18. Some of you probably forgot about Freddy, right? Back in season one, uh, Freddy was played a rather vital role in both Tommy and Ada's lives, being Ada's first husband and Tommy's childhood best friend. The history was rich and you could tell. All his scenes with both Tommy and Ada are amazing and always leaves you wanting more. Unfortunately, in season 2, the actor who played Freddy left the show for another, and his character was subsequently killed off due to the flu. He has ranked this high just purely based on how vital his role was in season 1, and the charisma his character had, being a real adversary to Tommy as well as a real ally in the end. Also, his dynamic with Tommy and the scenes they share were honestly some of the best in this whole show. It is a shame that his character is dead, but the time we had with him was phenomenal, and that is why he is ranked this high. Coming in at number 17 is May Carlton. Now, May Carlton was really the third main love interest for Tommy besides Lizzie and Grace, and if I'm honest, I honestly could say Tommy enjoyed being with May more than Lizzie for, from what we saw. In season 2, he had some genuine happy moments with her, and in season 4, he genuinely wanted to spend time with her. Furthermore, their dynamic in season 2 and 4 was great, and their chemistry really worked well together, with May wanting Tommy to change and become more normal, and Tommy not wanting to, but also wanting to spend time with May. It was just great, and she played a vital role in filling Tommy's heart after his departure from Grace in season 2. If I'm honest, most people say that Tommy should have actually married May instead of Grace. Do I agree? I'm not sure. I'll leave it to you guys to discuss in the comments. 16. Lizzie Shelby Now, Lizzie Shelby started off as a working lady whom was originally going to marry John, but her unfaithful nature, which was revealed when Tommy propositioned her with money, led to the demise of this marriage. 
From there, Tommy continued to entertain his casual relationship with her, employing her as his personal secretary and offering her a role in a more prominent and respectable life. She has a great scene in season 2, when Tommy requires her to play up her previous life's gestures in order to kill a military general. This shows the length at which Lizzie was willing to risk her life for Tommy. Furthermore, in season 3, she is quite legitimately the cause of both Grace's and John's eventual death at the hands of the Italians. If you remember, she was going out with Luca's brother, to which the Peaky Blinders did not approve, with John eventually cutting Angel Changretta, and thus leading to Grace being shot, Vincente being killed by Arthur, and then Luca killing John. Furthermore, in season 4, she becomes pregnant with Tommy's child, Ruby, and becomes Tommy's wife by the end. In the final two seasons, 5 and 6, she arguably has the most prominent role so far. In season 5, she constantly has conflict with Tommy and schemes with Linda to leave the Shelby life forever, to which she does eventually do. And in season 6, Tommy and Lizzie's relationship at first seems to be much better than in season 5, but eventually starts to deteriorate with the death of Ruby and Tommy's physical betrayal with Diana, all equating to her leaving in the finale. Overall, Lizzie had an amazing character development throughout the show, and evolved arguably the most out of any character. At 15, Linda Shelby. Now, I understand Linda is largely disliked by the show's fan base, yet she was a pivotal character with regards to Arthur and his story, and for, the, and for that reason alone, she is above those who came before. She was a crucial element of the show's later seasons. She is first introduced in season 3 as Arthur's new wife, whom genuinely wants to help him go on the straight and narrow path. He accepts God to a great degree, and in the eyes of Tommy and John, he becomes softer, unwilling to so willingly commit violent acts at the drop of a hat, thanks to Linda and her enlightenment. Her control over Arthur is established from the first episode she is in, with Linda being the only person who has more control over Arthur than Tommy. At first, Linda starts off as a good wife, whom genuinely wants to help Arthur. Throughout season 3, this relationship is strained as Arthur continues to commit violent, gang-related acts for his gang and broader family. However, at the end of season 3, Linda does in fact persuade Arthur to move to America with her, to which is eventually swindled by Tommy and Arthur is arrested. During season 4, Linda is living her ideal life with Arthur, showing how she had indeed been able to reverse the trauma to an extent and live a solitary, solitary peaceful life. She however starts snorting cocaine near the finale, and by the time season 5 comes around she is completely over Arthur and their Peaky Blinders lifestyle. She is shown to have transitioned from a loving wife who wants the best for her troubled husband, to a woman who wants to rid herself of her last name and relationships with those around. This all eventuates in Linda actually attempting to shoot Arthur herself, whom is only saved by Polly when she shoots Linda in the shoulder. Linda then leaves Arthur and doesn't return until the final two episodes of season 6, in which she plays a very minor yet majorly impactful role in helping to reform Arthur and help cure his drug addiction. Overall, Linda played a pivotal role in Peaky Blinders and is truthfully a second side to Arthur as a character, with her being responsible for a lot of his actions from season 3 onwards, such as him becoming re-addicted to drugs and his overall emotional state throughout these latter seasons. Coming in at 14 is Luca Cengretta, played by Adrian Brody. Now, Luca for me was an okay antagonist whom was amazing at certain times, and would have been higher if not for the sometimes over the top performance and overall sloppiness of his writing. Firstly, his motive is great to avenge the death of his father and brother, a classic revenge tale, and his presence was definitely felt in the first episode when, by his order, John was killed and Tommy infiltrated. The whole dynamic between the Italian Mafia and Peaky Blinders fell flat however, especially considering the stakes which were set up in the earlier episodes of season 4, and the sheer amount of tension, suspense and anticipation in which it left the viewers feeling. Tommy Chef is a black hand, a member of Luca's entourage? How deep does his organisation go? Does Tommy have people in his gang who are Luca's? People in his businesses? How infiltrated was Tommy's gang really? He also happens to deliver one of my favourite interactions in all of Peaky Blinders, being the meeting between him and Tommy in episode 2 of season 4, where he genuinely comes off as an intimidating antagonist with a real power, as well as coming off as evil vowing to kill Tommy's whole family before his eyes to inflict the most pain possible. He even has some great scenes with Alfie in his brewery, 
In spite of this intimidation, it showed throughout the season due to bad writing that Luca was not nearly as smart or intelligent as Tommy. Being outplayed simply by Tommy contacting Al Capone and bartering a deal to overthrow Luca's gang, whilst also literally buying off his men. In the end, Luca and his organization just fell flat and went out with a whimper, contrastingly to how they entered with a bang. Coming in at number 13 is Aburama Gold. Aburama Gold, what a character! He might be one of my personal favourites actually, especially in season 5 with his new sleek cut and moustache. In season 4 and 5, Aburama Gold is exceptional, being first introduced as another gypsy gang to help fight off the Italian Mafia, and then transitioning into becoming a Peaky Blinder, marrying Polly and becoming a member of the Shelby family. Aburama has this cockiness and arrogance to him which is so appealing and inviting to watch. From his initial confrontation with Tommy in Charlie's yard, to his comedic jokes in the final episode of season 5, during the family meeting. His dynamic with Polly as well was really nice. They were gypsy king and queen. Really perfect for each other, and showed genuine interest in each other. He was just a pleasure to watch really, and it was unfortunate that he died rather soon and in such a shocking way being killed at the hands of the IRA during a failed assassination attempt on Mosley during his speech. Nonetheless, the scenes which he shared with everyone were fantastic and in my opinion, he was easily one of the greatest characters on the show. At number 12 is Grace Shelby. Now, like Linda, Grace played a pivotal role in Tommy's life, being the motivation to go legit and with her eventual death, leading to the consolidation of organisations such as the Grace Shelby Orphanage, etc. Grace is first introduced as a spy working with Inspector Campbell to undermine the Peaky Blinders, but more importantly find the missing guns. She falls in love with Tommy, and Tommy with her. She however is outed as a traitor and she leaves Tommy at the end of season 1, after Tommy confesses no more feelings for her. She doesn't reappear until season 2, to which Tommy is still caught up on her, and her him. They have a nightly escapade, meeting Charlie Chaplin, etc, and then she falls pregnant to Tommy. We then get to season 3, where Tommy and Grace seem to finally be happy and together, having a great wedding and raising Charlie their son. As a quick side note, season 3 episode 1 might be one of my most favourite episodes within the whole series. Furthermore, Tommy even spoils her with a sapphire as a present, unfortunately however, she ends up being killed in episode 3 of season 3, and does not return until season 5, in which she is a mental illusion of Tommy's whilst he is on opium, constantly urging Tommy to kill himself and join her in the afterlife, his guilt essentially building up. Grace for me was always entertaining on screen and definitely had an interesting dynamic during season 1 with Tommy. She was more or less a side character in season 2, and finally in season 3 I did enjoy her scenes with Tommy quite a lot. I also liked her largely in season 5, as an almost ghost representing Tommy's guilt regarding his actions and how he usurped his power, and the consequences of. Overall, I enjoyed her character and her importance within the show was heavily noted. At number 11, Charlie Strong. Now, what can I say besides the fact that this is the man that is the most reliable member of the Shelby family? Always there when you need him. Even offering words of wisdom to Tommy throughout all of the seasons. He is, I believe, Tommy's mother's brother. So, Charlie is always a pleasure on screen and offers some of the funniest moments the show has to offer. As well as all this, his final shootout in season 6 episode 6 is sensational, and shows he still got it at his old age. Also providing a nice scene in which Charlie actually gets in on the action, and benefits the Peaky Blinders exponentially. He is simply a great, reliable, and charismatic character. Coming in at number 10, Johnny Dogs, Johnny Dogs. What can I say, an absolute legend and a living example of what a best mate him is reliable, trustworthy and just perfect really looks like. Johnny from season 1 always had Tommy's back as well as the Peaky Blinders, helping whenever he could, be it with Alfie's cargo packing in Camden Town, the f tunnelling in season 3, or even in season 6 when he literally saves Tommy's life by switching the car bomb. What a legend. Not to mention he shares easily the funniest scene in the whole show, always creating entertaining and funny scenes. He is genuinely one of the only characters whom is universally loved by all the fan base, really, and the reasons explained just previously tell you why. Also, for a quick funny throwback, 
Does anyone remember when Peaky, when people actually thought Johnny was the traitor in Peaky Blinders after season five? Hell, I thought he was a traitor for a moment, especially when in the season six trailer, it looked like Tommy was fighting him in the bar. Anyways, Johnny was and is a phenomenal character, and I hope he does indeed make an appearance in the upcoming movie. Coming in at number nine, Michael Gray. Now Michael's character is a mixed bag for me. I've always thought he was decent, yet his role in the final season really dampens his impact. From seasons two to four, he is shown to be a valuable asset to the company, perhaps even being the second most intelligent after Tommy, even being the company's financial manager. In season two, Michael is largely innocent, Although he does have a sense of arrogance and ambition as Tommy, this can be seen when he refuses to go back to his original orphan home, wanting to stay with Tommy, Polly and the Peaky Blinders. Initially, Michael doesn't really do anything in the family, and is merely there at Polly's request. Although, after Tommy promises Polly that Michael will deal with solely the legitimate business, he is allowed to convene more with his cousins, being Tommy, Arthur and John, etc. And for the most part, this is Michael's role being an ambitious, sometimes entitled, second Tommy, who handles solely the legitimate aspect of the Shelby company. He has some great scenes, especially in season three with Arthur and John, as he slowly is becoming more and more corrupt, such as when they are shooting guns during the night and Michael finally killing Father Hughes. Then in season four, he chooses to make a deal with Luca to spare Polly over Tommy, a completely understandable thing to do. For example, would you rather save your mother or your boss? This essentially exiles Michael to America, to which he meets Gina, and his down spiral begins. During season five, Michael has caused the Shelby company to lose a lot of money through the stock market. On top of this, he is constantly in strife and conflict with Tommy, aiding in Tommy's paranoia concerning his throne. Michael makes a play to become the leader of the Peaky Blinders, which is funnily rebuffed by Tommy, and Michael is completely kicked out of the family business. Now, this would actually be great if Michael had a satisfying ending. However, he does not, and spends basically the entire season six inside a prison cell, to then be shot in the head by Tommy in the season finale. He literally does nothing of any consequence to Tommy throughout the whole of season six, as he is simply outsmarted by Tommy in the literal first episode of this final season. Michael had the potential to be one of the greatest characters. However, his conflict and final stage concerning his character arc fell flat. At 8 is Ada Thorne. Now, Ada might actually have my favourite character development out of the whole show. She is first shown as the vulnerable younger sister, whom is in love with Tommy's childhood best friend turned enemy, Freddie Thorne. Throughout season 1, Ada constantly argues with Tommy, and even Freddie, eventually de-escalating the conflict between Kimber and Tommy, which doesn't work out, as Tommy is shot and Kimber eventually killed. Furthermore, in season 2, she is shown to be becoming slowly more independent, living by herself in London. She is still disagreeing with Tommy, but they are becoming closer and closer. By the time season 3 rolls around, she is becoming more prominently involved in the family's business, both legally and illegally, with her becoming the head of property and acquisitions for the Shelby Company Limited. When Tommy is injured by Father Hughes, she as well takes a pivotal role in avoiding the killings of all the Shelby gang members due to the Russians backstabbing, etc. And by season 4, she is almost entirely a new character, being much more confident and proud of her role in the Shelby company, as well as being more willing to defend Tommy, and think analytically as well, such as Tommy. This can be seen when she walks Linda home after John's funeral, putting aside her personal biases and grudges to look out for the broader family. Then in season 5, she is even more prominent within the company, as well as Tommy's life. She constantly discusses and confines within Tommy, as well as Finn, with her in the first episode instructing Finn to take it easy and relax, and later on, essentially being a therapist-like figure for Tommy to rant to. And then, finally in season 6, Ada becomes a top player, and is arguably my favourite her character has ever been in any of the seasons. From the beginning, she is shown to be very confident, and almost like a second leader to the gang, looking after Arthur, etc. Then throughout the remainder of the season, she becomes the boss of the Peaky Blinders for a day, bossing around Isaiah and dictating the gang's actions, as well as taking Tommy's place in the meeting with Mosley, Diana and Jack Nelson, to which she does hold her own very well. However, this must be stated, after the passing of Polly's actor Helen McCrory, I am not sure whether or not Ada was actually supposed to be this pivotal in the final season. 
or if Polly was actually instead meant to be the character in these previously mentioned scenes, such as with Jack Nelson. Nonetheless, Ada throughout Peaky Blinders has been phenomenal, and had possibly my favourite character progression throughout the whole show. All her scenes are great, and her role in the Peaky Blinders is undeniable. Seven is John Shelby. John is an amazing character, being the youngest out of the pivotal trio. He is often hot-headed and impulsive, yet innocent and kind-hearted. From season one, John has been shown as the most vulnerable brother, with his love for Lizzie, eventual marriage to Esme, and further down the line, his impulsive actions against Angel Changreta and many more things. An amazing scene which depicts John's nature is that when Tommy instructs him to kill Luca Changreta's mother in season three. John and Arthur simply refuse, with John being much more adamant and engaging in a full-blown argument with Tommy, even becoming very emotional. When it actually comes time to capture Vincente, John and Arthur do indeed spare the mother against Tommy's order, which does lead to John's death. But still, it shows John's kind nature and inability to completely become ruthless and violent. Polly even states in Season 4 by stating that John was a good boy. There isn't really much else to say, and those who have watched the show would know why. He's an essential and valuable character to Peaky Blinders and shares so many great scenes within the show that it's just too many to list. He's always a pleasure to watch on screen and adds a great degree of humour within each season. And he is one of the main characters of the show, so it's just undeniable that he should be ranked this high. Six is Major Campbell. Campbell was arguably the main antagonist in both season one and season two of Peaky Blinders. First off with Campbell, his motivations as a character were very clear and understandable. Initially, he is just employed to do his job. After all, in our modern world, technically Campbell in Season 1, and arguably in Season 2, is just doing his job and trying to protect society. Just such as looking for and acquiring the guns in Season 1, etc. What makes him a great villain, however, is his ability to be devastatingly ruthless and extremely mani manipulative to those around him. Such as threatening Arthur and Tommy on multiple occasions, and guilt-tripping the police commissioner ultimately using his authoritative power to proceed and carry out corrupt actions. A lot of his motivations and hatred towards Tommy are also drawn from his failure to successfully bond and have a relationship with Grace, his initial partner, and Tommy's eventual wife. Grace's inability to appreciate and love Campbell in place for Tommy enrages Campbell and furthers his hatred for Tommy and the Peaky Blinders gang, pushing a lot of his actions taken in Season 2. On top of all this, he commits arguably the most disgusting act on the whole show, being the hostile, manipulative rape of Polly in return for the release of Michael. To which Michael finds disappointing, in the sense that Campbell manipulated Polly to such a degree. And finally, the performance by Sam Neill was fantastic. Campbell really couldn't have been played by anyone else. Neill's ability to add a sinister undertone to the character was appreciated and should be commended. Five comes in is Father Hughes. Now, Father Hughes could potentially be the most dangerous adversary Tommy and the Peaky Blenders have ever faced. He had an exceptional degree of power, being a part of Section D. He had access to politicians, judges, police, literally everyone. The organisation he was a part of infiltrated every single aspect of society, very similar to the Court of Owls and Batman. He literally just arrested Tommy to display the power he had over him. He had this sinister arrogance to him. He literally played as if he was a god to the extent that he would literally order Tommy to do as he asked. One of the most uncomfortable requests consisted of Tommy designating him an office at his new orphanage so he could play with the kids, and not play in a good way. There are some more brilliant scenes in which he depicts the sinister arrogance, such as forcing Tommy to recite a prayer and replace God with his name whilst Tommy is about to pass out from a cracked skull and serious brain injury, which was also inflicted earlier by Father Hughes's thugs. Furthermore, it is also alluded to that Father Hughes sexually abused Michael when he was an orphan child, just to add another atrocity to his list. Also, two notable things should be that this is the only antagonist that was capable of damaging Tommy to such a severe degree, physically and emotionally. His men broke and destroyed Tommy's skull, and he damaged Tommy emotionally by kidnapping his son. Which, by the way, is possibly the most we have ever seen Tommy genuinely worried. Paddy Constantine was the actor who played him, you may also know him from the House of the Dragon as King Viserys most recently, and what a role he played. He was sensational and genuinely successful in making Father Hughes, the child molester, one of the most hated villains. An absolutely brilliant performance. Four is Sir Oswald Mosley. Mosley is arguably the smartest and has the potential to be the most dangerous villain within the Peaky Blinders. Much like Father Hughes, Mosley has a great degree of power. 
However, the only difference being that Hughes is so powerful because of Section D. He is more or less a member of the organization. Whereas Mosley is more or less like the leader of Section D. He is the leader of his political party with no one above him to dictate his actions or plans. Furthermore, Mosley definitely had the best conversational skills out of all the villains and potentially had even a higher intelligence than Tommy Shelby himself. Also possibly being better at planning strategies. Mosley constantly depicted in this season that he was always one step ahead of Tommy, as well as being more powerful. Such can be seen in the scenes within his office, the four-way meeting between Tommy, Arthur, Michael and Mosley, as well as the shooting scene where Mosley straight up dictates what Tommy will do. Furthermore, to add to his credibility, Tommy literally did not beat him in this season. His assassination attempt failed and Mosley survived. The first time ever in the series that an antagonist survived and bested Tommy. Also, his pure wit and intellect when facing off against Tommy was well known. He didn't necessarily present himself as a very masculine man, yet he oozed power and authority, even intimidating Tommy on numerous occasions. This power is finally displayed in season 6, when he does in fact survive unscathed, even in threatening Tommy that he will have him killed if he were to look at his wife Diana in the wrong way, causing Tommy to be physically shaken. Oswald Mosley was portrayed by the fantastic Sam Claflin. He portrayed the character brilliantly and added an almost upper class snobby arrogance to the character, which aided in his representation as a seemingly authoritative intellect and perfect for a pivotal antagonist for the Peaky Blinders and Tommy Shelby. So somehow whilst I was in the midst of writing this script, I completely forgot to include Alfie Solomons, one of my literal favorite characters from the show. So in the post edit, I am putting Alfie at this in-between spot between Oswald Mosley and Polly Gray. Uh, but I couldn't be changing all the other rankings, so um, that's why it's here. So Alfie, in my opinion, is easily one of the greatest characters on the show. He is phenomenal in nearly every way and manages to be extremely intimidating as well as extremely funny, easily having both some of the funniest and greatest scenes in the show. For example, his scene in Season 6, Episode 2, when he talks to Tommy about the Irishman, is just classic, Alfie, and a classic rambling scene, which is both funny and entertaining. Furthermore, one of my favourite funny scenes is in Season 3, where Alfie is reunited with Arthur in Tommy's home. This, is, <laughs> this scene is excellent and easily one of my favourites. It's intense, funny, and just brilliant. Speaking of brilliant... Another scene which is fantastic and depicts why exactly Alfie is ranked so high for me is once again season 3 episode 6 where Alfie and Tommy argue about someone stealing Tommy's child. In this scene, Tom Hardy as Alfie gives my favourite performance, arguably of the whole show, being the pivotal cross the line speech. This speech alone and the reason it is said by Alfie and what it means to his character as well as his relationship with Tommy is easily representative of this spot. Alfie truly is one of my all-time favourite TV characters and is an exceptional addition to the Peaky Blinders series. Quite simply, it wouldn't be the same without him. And that is why he comes in at this in-between spot. But regardless, very high spot. Three is Polly Gray. I see a lot of people claim that the show is as much Polly's as it is Tommy's, and whilst I may slightly disagree, Polly still has a colossal role within Peaky Blinders, and is arguably the second most important character after Tommy. She is shown to be more or less Tommy's second in command, more like a confidant or conciliary, very similar to Tom Hagen in The Godfather for Michael. Tommy confides his plans in Polly and always seeks her advice when it comes to his schemes and ambitions. She calls Tommy out when he's wrong, and even goes against Tommy in certain cases, such as the finale of season 3 when she wishes to hear a different view about the company. Furthermore, her character experiences a great degree of tragedy and redemption throughout the series. In season 2, she is raped by Inspector Campbell, and from there she becomes vulnerable and traumatised, which leads to some great television in season 3, which shows Polly recovering from her abuse with her new lover, and slowly starts regaining complete control of herself. That is until the finale of season 3, where she is nearly hanged, leading to a complete mental breakdown during the beginning of season 4, in which she has become a crazy recluse. However, this all passes and she once again proves to be a fundamental character within the gang, scheming with Tommy to outsmart Luca and concoct a great plan to actually see the end of Luca's gang. 
Furthermore, in Season 5, she is once again a main player, helping Tommy with his plans and facing trouble with Michael and his ambitions grow and conflicts arise. This all accumulates to Polly in the end, finding love with Abarama and completely retiring from the Peaky Blinders gang and company. Unfortunately and tragically, the actor for Polly, Helen McCrory, passed away before season 6 was filmed, thus she is absent physically, but is still definitely felt emotionally and spiritually, with callbacks to her character constantly being made. I can't help but think in season 6 that Polly would have perhaps helped Michael take on Tommy, or alternatively, helped her both her physical son and spiritual son in different ways, playing both sides as she loves them both dearly. We will never know, and the times and scenes which Polly did in fact have were among some of the greatest, and her performance within the show will be forever cherished and discussed. At second place is Arthur Shelby. Arthur Shelby is a phenomenal character depicting grief, guilt, addiction and love. He is constantly shown throughout the show to struggle with mental health problems caused by the war no doubt. In season 1 he is angry, aggressive and depressed, even attempting to hang himself. During season 2 he is equally angry and unhinged, killing a poor boy and is yet still trying to take a more prominent role within the family business such as taking over the Sabini's London club and refurbishing his garrison pub for a grand opening. However, he still struggles with his trauma from the war and resorts to cocaine, which he becomes hooked on. This is basically Arthur in a nutshell for the first two seasons. Tommy's right hand man, who will do any necessary act, no matter how violent, for the reputation and power of the Peaky Blinders. That is until season 3, when he meets Linda, his new wife. As previously stated, Linda puts Arthur on the seemingly straight path, introducing him once again to God and attempting to right the wrongs he has committed, and help him settle into a solitary, peaceful family life. However, this is not the case, as Arthur continues to operate within the Peaky Blinders. An amazing scene which depicts Arthur's complex contradictions is in Season 3, Episode 1, where he is informed to kill the Russian agent whom has attended Tommy's wedding. He literally pauses just before he shoots the Russian in the head, arguing with himself and banging his head violently against the wall, in conflict with a right or wrong, light and dark side of himself, eventually giving in to this darker, older, natural instinct side, killing the Russian. It is a great scene. Furthermore, in season 4, it begins with Arthur and Linda living happily and peaceful on a farm. They are raising chickens, Arthur is fixing cars and helping old people, etc. It is a happy, calm life. That is until John is killed and Arthur is pulled back into the fray, vowing to kill Luca Changretta. He slowly breaks out of this peaceful cocoon and begins, and begins killing Italians and resorting back to his old life. This once again culminates in Arthur killing Luca and avenging John. Season 5 and 6 argue with Arthur at his lowest. In Season 5 he constantly argues with Linda and brutally attacks one of Linda's male friends for simply talking to her, forcing Linda to leave Arthur but not before attempting to kill him. After this happens, Arthur goes off the deep end, once again falling into addiction, both heavily drinking and snorting cocaine. Then in season 6, he is constantly high on opium and for the most of this season, is high on any forms of drugs, depicting his methods of dealing with uncomfortable difficulties, such as Polly's death and Linda leaving him. Throughout the whole season, he struggles. Until Tommy gets Linda back into his life and he is seemingly finally redeemed and clean of any drugs. A full circle really. Arthur's complex nature and struggles with addiction, redemption, love and betrayal all allow for some amazing television and promote Arthur as a troubled angel, truly a monumental character and arguably as poppy as Tom popular as Tommy himself. With also to be mentioned, all his scenes are phenomenal and all scenes really which three brothers share together even with Polly, etc. They're just phenomenal scenes and they really make the show what it is. And as I'm sure you all guessed by now, or even before you even clicked on the video, coming in at number one is Tommy Shelby. Now, seeing Tommy Shelby as number one, there's not much that I can say that I haven't already said. So, basically, why I love him so much and I'm sure why all you guys love him so much and possible reasons are, uh, I'm gonna play now the section from another video I recently did called Why Tommy Shelby is so popular. So you can either watch the rest of this video to see why Tommy Shelby is so popular or you can simply click on the other video Why is Tommy Shelby so popular? It's more or less going to be the same thing. 
But in that video, I explained it perfectly and that explains it perfectly as well in this ranking as to why he's my number one spot. Tommy Shelby is the main pivotal character in the gangster TV drama known as Peaky Blinders. He is arguably one of the most popular characters in all of TV, even being named the most popular male character within the TV media by Lad Bible. Today we analyse and more importantly discuss what exactly makes Tommy Shelby so attractive and popular to viewers of both men and women around the world. It should be said initially as a disclaimer that Tommy Shelby is arguably so attractive and popular as a character because he is played by an exceptional actor in Killian Murphy. He is both attractive to men and women, depicting physical beauty and masculine drive, which is extrapolated through Killian's great performance. Now we must first begin with the benchmark for popularity, that most often entailing likability concerning characters, their relatability. This is why such characters as Spider-Man first became so popular, a regular dude who was experiencing the same teenage dramas as the readers at the time. Tommy is relatable in the sense that deep down he is a good man, who happens to do bad things to a good end, as the creator Stephen Knight has stated. Thus for the viewers, Tommy depicts the unacted upon evil that lays deep within all of us, the only difference being that Tommy exploits this evil and readily uses it in situations to benefit not only him, but his family and even the broader society in some cases. Most people in regular life feel lost. To watch and endure with Tommy as he rises the gangster and later political ladder is almost cathartic, comparable to such emotional feelings we would have as watching someone like Frank Underwood from House of Cards climb the political ladder. Furthermore, the reasons to which Tommy is exploiting this evil and deciding to willingly and almost sacrificially climb the ladder of power reveals the deeper DNA within the show. Family. You see, Peaky Blinders is far more than your average run-of-the-mill mob drama. This deep down is a story about family. A lower class, underdog-like family who rise from the depths of filth and immorality to the heights of power and wealth in a world which is drastically changing, for better or for worse. This is seen through each season which takes place in a new later year with arguably a greater threat each time, but whilst also showing that the Peaky Blinders themselves and Tommy have accumulated a greater wealth. This all continues until the final threat is Tommy himself, and thus this rise further adds another string of DNA into the concoction which is Peaky Blinders, that being how this rise to power and through social classes in an unrelenting world, affects the pivotal characters, how it changes them. This can be seen through the PTSD characters experience from the show due to World War 1, and even through events which occur in the show, like Polly's rape, and her PTSD and vulnerability gained from such a horrific experience. Most prominently however, this can be seen in season 5 and season 6 with Tommy. He begins to feel guilt for the actions which he has committed, and believes the spirits are punishing him for the deeds he has done allowing for the viewer just to feel sympathy for him and almost a sense of sadness even though considering the life he has lived has been very violent and arguably very immoral compared to how the average person would live. To add on further, Tommy makes you question these morals, almost inciting this darker element within yourself. It makes you question truly and puts yourself in his shoes. What would you do if you were Tommy? Would you condemn the evil and punish the wicked? Would you partake in the same activities, the same actions? What would you do differently? His actions are arguably so attractive because they are so dangerous. He commits violent acts and devious plans which we would think unfathomable in our modern everyday lives, and he does it all for the noble cause, being the betterment of his family. And even in season 6, the betterment of his community. He also represents to men the culmination of masculinity, an era bygone now depicting a drive and ambition to achieve great things in relation to business, women and family. This culmination of masculinity is not only valid for males, however this also makes him popular amongst females. His drive and ambition to achieve great things for those he cares about and look after those he cares about by providing a prosperous future is an attractive trait. It obviously helps that Killian Murphy is also considered an attractive man by many of the fanbase to say the least it should be stated that he is a good man doing bad things to a good end. He has constantly shown that the evil which he harnesses is usually, in most cases, used for good, and people enjoy seeing good people do great things for the communities. He cares for children, 
building them orphanages and representing their interests as he has no racial or cultural prejudice to anyone. This is even further seen in season 5 when he withdraws funding completely from an orphanage as the nuns had abused the children. Now this is hardly the only criteria needed to be a good person. But it is a start, a start which Tommy Shelby had made even before the first season had begun. From a young pre-war lad, he knew the system was broken, even signing himself up for what he believed to be the best cause at the time being communism. He has always had this fire to fight for what he believed was right, not only for him, but for everyone he cares for. He came to understand what royalty, politicians, businessmen and gangsters really are. Tommy fought in World War I, for what? Him and his comrades received no benefits, a little thanks, nothing really. Merely they were forgotten and tossed aside as pawns in a game. Realising this, he tosses his medals in the cut and begins his underdog rise to power, realising he needs to be as bad as his enemies if he wants to achieve a suitable, reliable and most importantly, safe future for his family. This is evident and eventuates as Ada Sister Finn in Season 5 Episode 1. Tommy has given us this opportunity, relating to a good, honest, influential role in society to do good. Deep down, Tommy Shelby is essentially an anti-hero, the symbol of a working class man whom achieved greatness through arguably evil ways to secure a prosperous future for his family and a potential better future for his community. Once again, evidence in the final episode ever of Peaky Blinders, in which the big mean, powerful gangster Tommy Shelby states that he is planning to build houses for good, ordinary working people, for no better reason as simply being a good thing to do. And that, I believe, sums it up rather beautifully. But yeah, anyway, that was the end of the video. Uh, I enjoyed ranking every single character in Peaky Blinders as a little homage for the upcoming 10 year anniversary. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and thought my decisions for the rankings were fair and yeah, accurate. If you had any other oppositions or different rankings, please feel free to comment them in the description. I always love reading your lists and comparing them with my own. But yeah, if you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing, leave a like and a comment, share it even to your friends or on Twitter or Reddit, wherever, share it to anyone. That really helps. And yeah. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day or night wherever you are.